Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. If you're interested in learning about the ketogenic diet like I was to save my own life, then this is probably the podcast for you. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about it. Six years ago, it saved my life. Three years ago, I started researching and talking with some of the authorities in the field and attending medical conferences about this to understand why and how keto so dramatically changed my and my wife's Judy's lives. The purpose of this podcast is to share our journey of discoveries with you in understanding how keto is so effective in improving so many different conditions, from obesity, epilepsy, diabetes, infertility, MS, Alzheimer's, heart disease, to name a few. So take a step away from all the hype you've probably heard and roll up your sleeves with me and join me weekly to explore this living miracle that anyone can access. We'll talk science, we'll talk food. We'll explore its history and evolution to today, which is that the sheer wonder of the ketogenic way of eating has changed untold number of lives, unlike anything before it. And in case I forget to mention it, please join our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp, and welcome back to another episode of the Keto Naturopath. Today is going to be another pretty exciting topic, I hope, if you like history, if you like evolution, if you like topics you really haven't heard in other forums that teach us about who we are today. I know, it seems all rather vague, so let me get to it. We're going to talk about a thing called Laron syndrome, and I did a podcast on this about two years ago. Uh, now some additional information, but it's a great thing to review and the, how I came to wanting to redo this again with some greater research was I was listening to a podcast and somebody said, oh, listen to this podcast. This guy is going over cancer in an evolutionary perspective. And I said, that's that's not new, but yeah, I'll listen to it. So about four weeks later, I listened to it and no, the information wasn't new on any of it. It was basically a rehashing, a reclaiming of information. I don't, he didn't say he did it, but it was just putting a book out there that was a rehashing of... Uh, Tom Siegfried's really brilliant work, Cancer is a Metabolic Disease, and Travis Christofferson's kind of monarch notes of that, of Tom's work, called uh, Tripping Over the Truth. So both Tom Siegfried and uh, Travis say that it's basically the same information trimmed down of a lot. So the Dr. Siegfried's original tome is a tome indeed. It's also somewhat expensive. It's a big, thick textbook, but glorious in its information that it contains. Really interesting. Anyway, I was listening to this podcast and they brought up Laron syndrome. And I thought, you know, hey, it's worth going over that again because people do need to understand a little bit of the interplay of hormones and biochemistry and keep it simple enough and practical enough that they can garner some of their lessons to help them understand what their situation may be. Okay, so guess what? Laurent syndrome, I explained what it is, but it was also covered in uh, Huffington Post and a number of other places. So it's not, you don't have to go to Cell or Nature or some very academic or arcane medical journals to read about this. It's, there's a lot to glean by just staying to the surface of what this does. So Laurent syndrome is a genetic condition that you have to be homozygous for, I believe homozygous for. I think it's what they call autosomal recessive, that unless you are homozygous, you're not going to show the symptoms of it. So what are the symptoms? The symptoms are being small, perhaps kind of dwarfism. And they think this may be related to larger populations historically in the world, such as pygmies, such as, if you can remember on Indonesia, there was in the evolution of of man, they found these small humanoid, meaning small three feet humanoid, complete humans, skeletal remains that go back, I don't know if it's 100,000 years, but tens of thousands of years. But they're very small. So they say, what, what is this? And so they're thinking these are populations in which this genetic predisposition expressed itself, and therefore that's why they're small. What is this being small about? Well, what this is, Laurent syndrome, is a condition in which we all have growth hormone, which is sent out from our pituitary gland through our whole body. Pretty straightforward. But this particular condition is that they have a genetically altered growth hormone receptor on the liver. So ordinarily, growth hormone would be kicked out of the anterior pituitary. So that's pretty much right between your eyes and just back a little bit. 
and it has various cycles, you know, and growth hormone gets kicked out through periods of intense workout. It gets kicked out during sleep, meaning it gets produced. It gets put into the bloodstream. And so there's certain times and certain conditions that produce growth hormone in all humans. Well, those with homozygous, meaning on both chromosomes, Laron syndrome, have this receptor on the liver that kind of stops it. So the growth hormone gets to the liver and ordinarily what that would do, it would trigger in a production of IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. And so you just now came off of last podcast, which is IGF-1. We talked about it relative to dairy in the issues there. And what I forgot to mention, by the way, in that podcast is that, you know, I've now I've done all this these labs and so many different people, whether they're students or clients or patients, I keep a massive database so I can get to see all these associations and I can spot now by one lab alone. There's other labs I could have done, immune labs and so on and so forth, but on a hormone lab and and IGF-1 is a hormone, it's what they, it's a proxy for growth hormone. Now you know how these two relate to each other. One stimulates the other and the growth hormone as that builds up in the bloodstream, it then decreases the release of of growth hormone and pituitary. That's a feedback mechanism. On that lab, on a spreadsheet, if I just go down, I can eyeball who is the biggest dairy consumer. The numbers range from 100 to about 300 from the patient population that I have seen. Neither of those numbers are dangerous, quote unquote, dangerous relative to IGF-1. However, if one has a prolonged continual exposure of high, let's say the 300 guy or woman, it's a growth hormone. It's going to make things grow. And so it makes hyperplasia, making things get bigger. IGF-1 makes things, tissues get bigger through the whole body, not muscle, not only muscle, but brain and kidney. It goes vast, bone strength. So, but it's hyperplasia. It makes things grow. But it also makes cancers grow. So it's responsible for, at higher levels, hyperplasia and neoplasia, which is cancer. And that's the problem. So we like growth hormones, especially as we get older, because we tend to atrophy if we don't work out enough. And we have to work out even more than we did when we were younger to keep our muscle, skeletal muscle, alive and strong. And it has to be intense to compensate for it, to really drive, to really create a growth hormone response that will just do what growth hormone does. Hits the liver, liver produces IGF, but it does it on an event basis. It doesn't stay high. You And we get some of it from our sleep, less as you get older. So you do these things to get your binge, if you will, of IGF, of growth hormone to IGF-1. Okay, so Laurent syndrome has this receptor problem for growth hormone on the liver. So the growth hormone comes in and it hits the liver. Ordinarily, it would trigger production of IGF-1 and it would trigger gluconeogenesis. It would produce the production of glucose. So IGF growth, growth hormone is instrumental to survival. So what they find in Lerone syndrome, and by the way, they've started studying or the, the earlier studies of L-A-R-O-N, Laron syndrome, goes back to the early 60s. And I'm going to break and give you a break, meaning I'm going to go off topic and come back to the topic. But now I'm going to give you a little history of what we know about where this came from. So it came from Semitic people, i.e. Middle Eastern Jewish people. But the, what we're going to come from, we're going to, we're going to end up on a study that actually ended up in Ecuador. And so Ecuador was probably the most biochemical and genetic exploration of Laron syndrome ever. How did we get to Ecuador? And the diaspora of Semitic people sort of left the Middle East as much as they could. There was a group that went to Spain and Portugal called the Iberian Peninsula. So the Iberian Peninsula is basically Spain and Portugal. It's that big lump of peninsula. So they call it the Iberian Peninsula. Spain at one point, at one point being the 1300s and 1400s, after the Moor invasion and so on, that they were the largest, one of the largest population of Jews in the world. And I think at one point it was the largest population. They were a very academic ethnic group. They were philosophers, poets, uh, high achievers. 
And then came the Spanish Inquisition. And these Jews, they were called the Sephardic Jews because the Hebrew word for Iberia was Sephardic. Sephardic. So from there we get Sephardic. Well, come the Spanish Inquisition, and they were exterminating. They, they first were basically torturing and exterminating Sephardic Jews, but they gave them three choices. You can stay in Spain and convert to Catholicism. You can leave, in essence, be exiled, or you could die. Uh, dying they knew, um, obviously. So they they went to a lot of other locations. And so I'm going to uh, read you a little bit about this. And, and Spain has come around on all of this for a while so it says, historians still debate the number of Jews expelled, some 40,000, others say 100,000, those who fled sought exile in places that would have would have them, Italy, North Africa, Netherlands, eventually the Ottoman Empire, which was the largest country that had Sephardic Jews after the fact. And the, the language that Sephardic Jews spoke, which obviously was a, a, was a mix of Spanish and Hebrew, they called it Ladino. And it was a variant 15th century uh, Spanish, and it is still kept. So for all these expelled uh, Sephardic Jews, many of them have kept the tradition of learning this language, Ladino. And it was considered a dead language, and now, now it's actually being taught. Okay, anyway, tens of thousands stayed, but converted, and remained vulnerable to the perils of the Inquisition. How many Jews were killed, Marines unclear. But widely accepted estimate is 2,000 people during the first two decades of the Inquisition, with 1,000 more tortured and killed throughout its full course. So in 2015, so I just jumped from about 13 or 1400s to 2015, the peak of the exiles or the peak of the number of Sephardic Jews leaving Spain was the same time in which Columbus was leaving. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Well, that was the time in which the edict of for the Sephardic Jews of stay and convert, stay or die, or leave the country. So they all left. How does this figure to Ecuador? So Ecuador, now the new world is being discovered, right? Hispaniola and so on is just being discovered primarily via Spain and a bit of Portugal as well. Uh, driving this exploration is that a group of them, these Jews who carried the gene for their own syndrome went to Ecuador. So for 400 years, they lived in Ecuador up in the mountains as their own particular colony, if you will. And I'm going to get returned to that group later in a second. So in 2015, what's interesting is Spain now did a, I'm sorry, any and all people related to the Sephardic Jews who left um, back due to the Inquisition can come back. You know, I reapply and be a a member of our, our give you a citizens of Spain, and they're expecting hundreds of thousands, not many. I think it was maybe uh, thirty or fifty thousand did come back from around the world to live in Spain and the cities that their forefathers had come from. So it's fascinating. So it's still very topical, and now Ladino is taught at university as uh, reviving the language. And there are certain communities, even in the United States, that are known for their Sephardic Jew enclaves. And one was Seattle. Isn't that interesting? Now off to Ecuador. And why is this Ecuador story so important? So it's about 1490. And the Sephardic Jews that have escaped Spain to go to Ecuador, they are considered, there's another reference called uh, Conversos, was these particular Sephardic Jews who came to Ecuador. What happened was that there was a doctor, there was kind of a country doctor that goes back to visit some of the native Indian villages. You know, these are uh, roadless hillsides to find village after village of these native Ecuadorians and to treat them. Sounds like a fascinating practice, doesn't it? So he came across this group of Caucasians, in essence. Hispanics that were their own village, and they were normal in many ways, but had a high percentage of dwarfs, had a high percentage of people who were under three feet. So he started, this person in himself said, hmm, you know, and he, but he also noticed that um, these people who were short didn't get cancer, 
they could have been obese, partially obese. And he believed that they had something special that gave them longevity genes, even though they were, some were obese, not all. This, we were now speaking of the small people, dwarf population of the Sephardic Jews that were in Ecuador. So he kept on pursuing it. He finally connected with a number of people at UCLA, one being Walter Luongo, among others, that went back to find out what is the secret, quote unquote. I think the original doctor also realized it had a lot to do with lack of IGF. Now taking all the genes and looking at their blood work and so on and so forth, what they found was they did live to an old age. They did have a high propensity for longevity, except that in their village, they had a high rate of alcoholism and they called other accidents. And so those who didn't succumb to alcoholism or an accident lived for a pretty long time. So they started looking further and they thought maybe this genetic receptor that prevented IGF-1 from being produced at all or produced in very low quantities had something to do with them not having cancer. Hmm. So they looked further and they found out sort of going forward with all this is that sure enough, the reasons these people are so little and there's a, a picture that we'll put for the, um, we'll use for the podcast. It's a 67 year old man who has Laurent's type dwarfism with his seven year, his five year old daughter and son seven and 10. And they are all larger than he is. And so he's a little over three and a half feet tall. That's, that's the severe difference this is. Because of this intensity, sort of renewed interest in Laron syndrome, even though it's been going on since the 60s from the Middle East, that's how they could track it. They're now looking for if there are similarities between the pygmies of, of Africa and also the uh, very old hu small humanoids from uh, Indonesia called Florensiensis or something like that. So that this gene has been kicking around and when it got to be pretty dominant in certain populations, those populations were small. So what does this have to do with anything? Well, going forward, so now we're looking at, so the conclusion we came from that was that if you have low IGF numbers or no IGF, you're one, you're not going to be able to grow because IGF does a lot of things. It makes sure that you have enough muscle, your bones are can grow and are strong. Uh, it has to do with kidneys, pregnancy, so on and so forth. So you get a lot of underdevelopment, but also a lot of, you know, you, there's no growth factor for cancers and other things. So some things are small and some things don't grow at all, i.e. cancer. So you'll find if you look into, and I'll put some links here to a couple articles, if you look into that, you'll it's fascinating genetic story. It's also a fascinating story around IGF. And this is what you'll see in many cancer studies now, they cite IGF as being a factor that incites, if you will, or supports cancer growth. And without it, it doesn't happen. My interest in this was taking this lab, IGF, through all the people we've worked with, I can see it's a factor and I can see the, the dairy lovers. And one of the disagreements that I have is that keto people, all these gurus, of names that you would know if I was to mention, they say, oh, dairy's fine. You just have dairy. Well, I think they're feeding that. I think that, no, they're not going to get pathologically high IGF numbers. But guess what? Those are rare instances of, of finding things that high, consistently high in anybody ever at all, anywhere. So having 300 versus 100 is a significant difference if that's your norm over time. Yeah, you might have bigger muscles and so on and so forth, but you'll have a greater propensity for various cancers to grow as well. On the last podcast, we talked about, for different reasons, we talked about acne, dairy, and cancer, and that had a lot to do with IGF and other things. That's where they go to saying IGF is a factor for cancer because if you didn't have IGF, you don't have cancer. And you can even have obesity, and if you didn't have IGF, you wouldn't have cancer. They go back to the Ron patients. And so they're saying the Ron patient mutation means that their growth hormone receptor lacks uh, the last eight units of its exterior region so that it cannot react to growth hormone in normal children. Growth hormone makes the cells of the liver churn out another hormone called IGF-1. 
and this hormone makes children grow. If the wrong patients or kids, children, are given doses, independent, given doses of IGF-1 before puberty, they can grow to fairly normal heights. So again, it's that before puberty phase. If you can get to them and get they, they are genetically identified, in essence, they take growth hormone, IGF, wouldn't, don't have to give them growth hormone, but IGF, they will be normal. Fascinating, huh? So in one way, it's very easy to treat once identified and being young enough. After puberty, it wouldn't make a difference to give them uh, IGF or growth hormone. Okay, so for that, this is a pretty quick podcast, but I wanted to follow up and saying, you know, IGF is significant. It's something that I bet none of the people that I'm talking to right now has ever had IGF. And it's not a very expensive lab to have. Certainly nothing like glucagon in terms of cost, but it can be what you need to do, just like with insulin, glucose, and your CRP inflammatory markers. You just take these routinely. You get to see where things are. My wife, who had a meningioma, and so when we go up to Tufts once a year for her MRI and you know, a little bit of a consult with the neurologist there, neurosurgeon, and we brought up the IGF, and he said, well, it has to be really high. And so what he's talking about is some sort of pituitary adenoma of some sort that is going to produce such unrelenting high levels of IGF that, well, growth hormone that lead to IGF, that it then makes the cancer grow. I'm saying that, well, those are the dramatic and high cases. I think chronically high normals or just slightly out of range. And that's, there's a lot of consensus around this can also be a problem and as a predisposing factor for various cancers. All right. And so that brings it back to dairy, but that was the last podcast. All right. Till next time. I hope you got something out of this. And now you know what uh, Sephardic Jews are and how their diaspora was cast across the the world in essence, and it's now being called called back home. But as an intellectual part of Spanish history, they were huge. It was a big part of who Spain developed into because of all of their focus and academic, the schools that were there. I mean, it's uh, really interesting, the history of Sephardic Jews and what they created in Spain. Till next time. Bye-bye. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp. I just wanted to encourage you to send in your questions to drgoldcamp at ketonaturopath.com. Many of you have, and so what I've done with these questions that I've gotten back to most of the people I email, but some of the questions that were so good, and if they were overlapping to other questions, I would combine them and try to put that into the topic of a podcast, either via one of the micro topics that are covered in an interview. As you know, we cover a lot of topics in any given interview or some of my own sort of reporting, if you will, on some of these issues. So please keep the questions coming. Feel free to send in an email and uh, I will get back to you. Stay listening, send in your questions, and I will definitely get back to you.